Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again David McIlvaney. David uh, is the president of the McIlvaney Financial Companies, McIlvaney Wealth Management, and ICA. That's a precious metals brokerage firm. And uh, you can, I guess the best place to go to is McIlvaneyICA.com. You can branch off into the other things that David provides, uh, wealth management, and one of my favorite services that he provides is a weekly podcast, McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, McIlvaneyWeeklyCommentary.com. Uh, after the markets close at the end of the week, and it's a, a look at the, uh, of all the, well, not everything that took place, of course, but the major highlights in the markets, uh, geopolitically, uh, politically, nationally. And uh, so obviously, uh, David uh, and his host have had a lot to talk about. Recently, and I think a lot of very informational, a lot of very important information that you can obtain there. And David's wisdom and years of market experience uh, could be very helpful to you. So I suggest you go there. But I would also, more than anything, like to suggest you go to davidmacalvaney.com to learn more about the personal side of David. And I gained a, I, I gained a great deal of insight into the demi- multi-dimensional side of David. Reading his book, The International Legacy, a few years back. And not only uh, is uh, David uh, a very bright Oxford graduate, very articulate, as uh, those of you who have heard him before know, um, but there is a very lively, constructive, uplifting spiritual side of David that I think you can um, get a sense of if you go to McIlvaney.com. Uh, and if you pick up his book, um, I think it's very important, uh, the, intru- the Intentional Legacy uh, it's very important, and um, you know, we, rather than leaving things go on haphazard, but to have a plan. Uh, and, uh, and David and I were just chatting a little bit before we started this discussion. Uh, David said, "Everybody, uh, I think you quoted Mike Tyson saying, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face.' Well, I guess the real thing then is to, act, you know, to ask ourselves, how do we act once we get punched on the face? So maybe David can help us out with that. Thanks for joining me again, David." Hey Jay, great to be with you again. It's always, um, it, yeah. This is this is certainly an interesting environment. There's a, there's a few more right and left hooks that seem to be flying. So oh. maybe 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 we need to keep in mind Plan A and Plan B. Yeah, right and left hooks. I think you're right about that. Um, and I think what we want to do is find out how to navigate those right and left hooks. And I know you had some thoughts about that on your um, on your last uh, uh, podcast last week. In fact. Um, I, I listened to it. Um, so, you know, the national focus over the past couple of weeks has been since the, since the wrongful death of uh, George Floyd by a white police officer. It's, it's really opened up the racial wounds again that run so deep in this country since the days of slavery, of course. Um, but there seems to be anger that goes over and beyond that. And besides much of the activity that's taken place over the last over the last few days and weeks suggests that people aren't really all that concerned about maybe some of the minorities, the black people and, and their lives, but rather there seems to be an underlying anger that is bubbling over. And I have to think that there's a lot more to it than not to, not to diminish the racial issue. I think that's a very important issue. But what are your thoughts, David? Why all of this enormous anger in our country? You know, I think whenever you're in a relationship and if you're talking about a community, a group of people or an individual, when you experience something painful, sometimes that pain and the response that you have to it overwhelms everything else. And, you know, if you have an abrasion on your arm, 99% of your body may be fine, but that one factor may override everything. And, and the feelings associated with it can be very, very intense. And yeah, what I see is a generation or multiple generations who have experienced undereducation and underemployment. They've not been factored into the great credit expansion and thus the asset price explosion over the last uh, you know 40 plus years. 1982 to the present, you've got the Dow and the S and P up 33 times. And if you didn't have excess savings to put into the market, you didn't see the benefits of an increase in personal wealth. So in that sense, you're talking about as a consequence of undereducation and underemployment and thus not enough capital to put out there. 
um, there wasn't a participation on the upside. So um, I, I get it that, that there's there's a lot of pain. I, I don't understand it directly because I'm not implicated. I, I you know only the person who's experienced a wound can really speak to uh, the pain and anger. Um, as a civil society, or there are limits to what can be expressed. Um, there has to be insofar as, as you want to maintain civility and or society. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know how things are going in your part of Colorado, David. Have you seen some uprisings there, some looting and so forth in any of your, in Denver or any of the other cities that you're closer to? You know, we left Denver in 92, so we didn't have to deal with the jabs, the right and the left hooks. We're, we're now the only thing that you can do in terms of jabs is probably social media. We live in a small town in the mountains. Uh, by choice, and this was the foresight and wisdom of my father saying that perhaps in future days this decision could save lives. And you know, I, I look at the idea of of being in a strong town, in a strong community, and think this just makes sense. Would I want to be in a major city center today or living in in suburbia? No, I, th- I think at this point, if I was living there, I would be organizing a new Plan A uh, and. You know, making a significant change. So I, I just I think I think we're living in a very interesting time, and in places where you can know your neighbors um, and 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 band together um, as as friends, even if you don't see things or the world the same way, uh, there's just there's a there's a there's a difference to a small town community, in my opinion. Yeah, well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, Teresa and I live here in in Queens. Um, and not far away from a lot of the turmoil that's taken place, and uh, a, a small group of Black Lives Matter. I think we're we're planning a march around our our uh, usually very peaceful park, and so it is. You know, it is certainly a thought. And but obviously, most people will still be living in cities. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> my wife is a city girl. She loves the uh, she, you know she loves the cultural things that Manhattan has to offer. But these days, with COVID nineteen and all, we're not even not even enjoying those very much, and restaurants aren't aren't available and so forth yet either. So, uh, but but you know, living where we are, I think you know, how do you? Most people will be living in the cities. I think it's. it's I mean, I, we're seeing an exodus, no doubt about it. I think real estate prices have started to drop in Manhattan. Uh, at least the upper end of uh, prices have, and. So you have to think that there's probably going to be an exodus away from the cities as long as the turmoil continues. But uh, I guess the question is, you said you might have a plan B if you had to live in the city. Uh, do you have some ideas of what plan B might look like if you were forced into living in Queens where Teresa and I live? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th- I think one of the things that I gleaned from Barton Big's book, Wars, Wealth, and Wisdom, was this idea of having a place that you can get to, not Three quarters of the way around the world, um, but but you know not too far away, um, where you can be sort of out of the maddening crowd. Mm-hmm. And I do recommend the book. It's it's kind of a, a layman historian. Of course, he was one of the chief economists at Morgan Stanley for sure. years. Uh, but you know, a layman historians look at crisis and the aft, uh, aftermath for asset classes. Mm-hmm. And you know, at one point in the book, he says it's it's kind of nice if you can close the front gate. In other words, having a few acres. Mm-hmm. Um, and make sure you've got a few shotgun shells and enough wine to just kind of sit things out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, you know, I mean, there's, there's kind of a, a middle point between the, 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 the prepper idea of prepare for the end of the world and um, living a fairly normal life on your own terms, just with enough space to where you don't have to stand in lines with with, with angry and frustrated people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the beautiful thing about crisis is, if you look at the last hundred years or two hundred years, every crisis uh, was defined by a very short period of time. Whether it was days, weeks, months, or years, it didn't go on. None of them went on indefinitely. Mm-hmm. So. It begins and it ends, and we're somewhere in between right now with this little crisis. Right, and the name of that book was Wars, what was it, from Barton Bakes? It was Wars? Yeah, Wars, Wealth, and Wisdom, uh-huh. although you might switch those around, but Barton yeah. Bakes, if you search it, you'll be able to yeah. find it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm wondering what you and, and Doug Nolan and, and the rest of your professionals there uh, in the wealth management team are looking, how, how you're viewing these markets. I mean, it's just... 
Uh, I can't remember a yeah. time, and I'm a lot older than you, David. I'm closer to your father's age. I remember very well the 1960s as a young person, what was going on there with the uh, cities burning across the country. It happened. Um, and But this seems to be a stage beyond, perhaps. I, I hope not, but it, it does seem to be very frightening. Uh, so, you know, I'm wondering wh- how you're seeing this economy emerging. I think I saw somewhere on the on the Internet that you were looking for, or maybe you and Doug were, were predicting something like 15,000 on the Dow, and as I look at it now, that, that would be a, another 10,000 points lower. Uh, that certainly would, uh, would, uh, would unnerve a lot of those people at the upper end of the uh, income scale, wouldn't it? Sure, it would. And I think, you know, if, if you're looking for good sources of weekly conversation and data, um, if you go to our website, the wealth management website, mwealthm.com, we've got the Credit Bubble Bulletin put out by Doug. We've got the Hard Asset Insights, which is a one-page summary uh, for, for hard asset investors. Um, and then my podcast. So great resources to, to tap into there. You know, when we look at the markets today, um, we see the same kind of um, set aside. There's really no concern with risk as long as you have the Federal Reserve backstepping all asset classes. So we're, we're back to levels that we saw in February. Um, if you're looking at sort of internal dynamics in the credit markets, if you're looking at credit default swap spreads, if you're looking at all kinds of things that would indicate to us you know, a real, again, level of complacency. And I think people would say, no, we're fully engaged. We just understand the implications of central bank money printing. Mm-hmm. And, and I would just have to say, if you understand the implications of central bank money printing, you may have peace and calm in the stock markets going forward. A, a bought price, not a real price, mm-hmm. um, but a supported price by the central bank. Uh, to do that is going to cost you something in the credit markets and in the currency markets. So my my suspicion is that in 2020 and 2021 um, give us a transition to a new understanding of risk in the dollar market. And, you know, do I think that's going to be positive for gold and silver? I do. Do I think it's going to be positive for anything of a tangible nature? Uh, yeah, I, I do. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's, that's kind of where we would say, look, if they can buy stability, there is a cost to everything, and and the cost will show up uh, with with, vo- with a lot of volatility in in the monetary arena, in in, in the in the currency arena. So, so your outlook, uh, yours and Doug's outlook for interest rates, uh, artificial as they are, would be continually low. And do you see any any prospects of that of market forces overwhelming the Fed anytime soon? Yeah, I think that's the real tug of war, Jay, is you've got the, the market forces, which would, over time, argue that you've compromised on credit quality, and there's consequences to that. Uh, on the other hand, you have a free pass with the central bank's balance sheet being used to mop up any mess that's out there. We've seen that with the high-grade market. We've seen that with the investment-grade market. Uh, that I said high-grade. I meant high-yield. Mm-hmm. Um High yield is is the new euphemism, I'm sure you know, for junk bonds. And, you know, when the government steps in, the Fed rather steps in and starts buying that paper, um, is it any surprise to see, you know, uh, an, an unusual pricing dynamic? And that's what we have. If people are willing to play that game, that's fine. People are also willing to play that game right now. It looks like there's strong interest to buy a billion dollars worth of stock for, for Hertz. Yeah. Hertz has already been <laughs> declared bankrupt. They've been declared bankrupt. We know that the value, given that they've got $18 billion in debt, uh, the odds of the equity owner coming out with anything are, are, are next to nothing. And yet people are willing to put an extra billion dollars in just to kind of day trade their way towards nirvana. This is a bad idea. This is a very bad idea. And ignoring risk, uh, you can do it for a period of time, but ultimately there is a piper to be paid, whether it's Hertz, whether it's the S&P 500, whether it's the Dow. Yeah, we, we think, you know, Dow 14, 15,000, what that reflects is a correction of the excesses in the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, will there be a concerted effort to keep it from getting there? Well, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe we don't. Maybe we don't get to a point where we see natural pricing again. And ag- again, I think if the Fed wins, we all lose because the value of the dollar will be in the toilet. That's the consequence. The Fed wins, we all lose. Yeah, the value of the dollar actually is something I wanted to ask you about because uh, speaking of uh, Morgan 
Stanley. Um, we saw Stephen Roach write something last week, or I think it was just the last week. Uh, his concern about <clears throat> the direction of America geopolitically and financially, and I know that you've never been a big believer, at least not in recent years, about the demise of the dollar as a world's reserve currency, and I'm not sure that Stephen Roach was necessarily saying that. I think he talked about a 35% decline in uh, in the dollar index, which is not the end of the world. I think maybe back to levels where we were a few years back. So that certainly doesn't suggest that the dollar is toast as far as uh, as far as the world's reserve currency goes. But what are your thoughts about the dollar now? And certainly uh, we know that gold maybe doesn't change in terms of its purchasing power over long periods of time, but relative to currencies that are debasing, gold rises, and that's the way you preserve your wealth. But but in terms of the geopolitics, because it seems to me, David, what's going on now, all of the things that are going on internally in America, China and other countries are not, they're very much aware of it, and they're using it for propaganda purposes or whatever. But just what are your, your thoughts and maybe Doug's thoughts about about the dollar right now? Where it stands. Yeah, I, you know, I think Stephen Roach is a really sharp guy, and he is looking at sort of losing um, some some clout in the in the international universe. And mm-hmm. obviously, with, with trade war with China, we, we've we've kind of diminished the role of petrodollar recycling. With a trade war with China, we're also diminishing the role of of trade dollar uh, recycling with the Chinese. And so, in terms of external financing sources for our debt. Uh, that's a real issue going forward. Mm-hmm. If we're just going to do the MMT thing and internally finance, uh, that's fine. You can try that. Um, <laughs> it's been tried before, and, and, and the consequences were pretty dire. Um, you know, loss of purchasing power on a grand scale. And so do, do I think the dollar goes down significantly? I, th- I think that's very reasonable. Um, do we lose reserve currency status? Have to have a replacement to, to take its place. The euro can't do it. Uh, the RMB is is nowhere near ready, uh, and there's not a depth of capital markets developed there as of yet. So you know, by default we win, and and it's kind of the old cleanest dirty shirt argument, or as, as Ian McAvity used to say, best looking horse in the glue factory. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that you're on a great path. It just means that you're kind of better than the rest on a relative basis. That kind of stinks. Uh, on an absolute basis, it stinks. On a relative basis, we're just a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that mean for gold? I, I do think that we take out the old highs pretty quickly, and, um, and and eventually, when there is some inflation concern, then silver starts to close the gap. There's a huge gap, and it's been telling you um, for a couple years now um, that there's there's not going to be a lot of inflation. Um, now, I think you know between the manipulations of CPI, PPI, PCE, and all their measures of chained and unchained for inflation metrics. Um, I, you know, you, you're just going to have to look around and say, does it exist or does it not exist? And I think that's where Stephen Roach and a bunch of really sharp guys who've left Wall Street, he's now teaching economics at Yale, mm-hmm. um, and a bunch of guys who, who retired from hedge fund management and are just running their own books, they'd look at it and say, yeah, you better own gold in here. You mm-hmm. better own gold in here because you can't do this job with trillions of dollars and um, – I mean, I, I don't know if they're playing defense or playing offense, honestly, because some uh-huh. of the hedge fund guys that are interested, they really are only in for fun and profits. So I, I don't know what the best way of looking at it is. I tend to look at gold as insurance, mm-hmm. um, but I think the price increase could be considerable mm-hmm. um, uh, give, given a 24 to 36-month time frame. It might even be a game-changing for personal finances. Yeah, it, it really could be. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, if we, if we get... So far, the money, it goes into the banking system to a great extent. I mean, we had the repo issues and the Fed. And as a matter of fact, I, I think I read last week that the Fed is actually upping the amount of money it's pumping into the system to keep the repo market from uh, from, from collapsing again. And so you have money going into the banking system. And again, as you said earlier, you know, the masses of people are not really benefiting from it. They're not. They're not really... Uh, participating in the wealth that's being created, sort of redistribution of wealth to the people that are closest to the feeding trough. And I'm just wondering um, uh, if, if, you know, to the extent that we might get helicopter money or more of the same, you know, $1,200 checks into everybody's bank account, uh, do you see that coming? And if so, do you think that could finally, at some point in time, 
start monetary velocity picking up because I think one of the things that's happening is, you know, people with money, uh, they're just they're pumping it into financial assets and getting richer and richer. And the people that are living one paycheck to the next, um, you know, they're they're having a really hard time now with all of the unemployment and everything. And so, do you expect that we're going to see more helicopter money, more money put directly into the people's hands? And if so, might that be something that starts to trigger velocity? Or are people in such dire straits, say average, below average, you know, middle class and lower, uh, lower middle class and so forth, that they don't have enough money to spend even if the restaurants were open to go places? And so they're just, whatever they get, they'll just sit on and hope to pay their rent next month. You know, it's interesting to watch the number of small-time investors hit Robinhood and yeah. start speculating in penny stocks. You know, that that's kind of, you know, are people being cautious and saving money, you know, hoping that they can pay rent? Uh, there's a real speculative mood out there, and I don't quite get it um, because, you know, we, we are somewhere between a major recession and a depression in terms mm-hmm. of the economic consequences of shutdown. And, yeah, I do think you're right, fiscal – Spending is going to be uh, the order of the day. Um, look at education. Look at education reform. They'll 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 come out with and trump up, uh, no pun intended, for all kinds of reasons to spend money. And you know, I, I think when when I think one of the le- latest latest tweets from Trump was again criticizing Jerome Powell and and uh, you know not doing enough and and whatnot. Um, and lo and behold, this week is is one of those weeks where it, it, I guess last week pretty thin. Fed balance sheet grew 3.71 billion, mm-hmm. so they basically turned off the tap uh, in terms of Fed asset monetization. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are the lowest numbers. That's the least amount of Fed asset monetization since February. So if if Trump and company don't get enough juice from the Fed, will they be putting political pressure on to spend more money, send out more checks, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely they will. And you're right, velocity is a really interesting thing. Velocity has been lower and lower, even though they've created money, it's flown into the asset markets and not into the economy. Mm -hmm. So we haven't seen a pickup in inflation. And now I think we are looking at uh, velocity uh, potentially picking up in a major way. Where velocity picks up and then goes into hyperdrive is when a psychological event occurs Mm -hmm. where the average investor begins to anticipate inflation at higher levels and they change their investment and they change their uh, consumption patterns. And so that's where the Fed wants to play the game of, look, we're going to keep raising the inflation target, but oh, we fail, oh, we fail, oh, we fail. Hmm. To, ke- to make sure that nobody gets panicked, nobody gets concerned about inflation, and all of a sudden treats bonds like the toxic paper they are. Um, so it's an interesting dance they've got. Mm-hmm. Create inflation, pretend like the problem is deflation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, there's the potential for asset price deflation because of so much debt in the system. Um, but the short answer to your question is fiscal spending, you betcha. Another trillion between now and the year? Uh, that, that that's easy. Maybe two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A, a trillion here, a trillion there, and pretty soon it becomes real money. I think it was uh, Senator Dirksen years ago that I think he used the B word instead of the G word to, to make that statement. But here we are. Um, well, I'm just wondering then, in terms of wealth management, you have uh, maybe you just talk a little bit about what wealth management does and and who that service is for. I think you're probably looking at people. You know, upper middle, upper middle class people at least, people that have, can put in a fair amount of money because otherwise it, it doesn't work. The economics don't work too well, probably. But yeah, what are you doing at wealth management, and and you know, to what extent are you putting money into equities, into you know, big name mainstream equities, and to what extent are you putting into gold stocks or gold bullion, or or what? Do you, how are you doing things? And I know that Doug Nolan plays a big role in uh, in your thinking there uh, at wealth management. Yeah, a couple of key people in the team. Um, Lila Murphy uh, does a lot of fundamental analysis for us on specific companies within the hard asset space. And for us, hard assets are made up of infrastructure, real estate, global natural resources, and precious metals. And so those four categories give us a broader definition and greater diversification. We'll want 25 to 40 names with a focus on income generation. 
And, you know, our basic assumption is that there is a consequence to money printing and that real assets, things that have an intrinsic tangible value, that makes more sense. So infrastructure could be everything from, you know, water utilities to cell phone towers. Real estate has got to be specialty niche. Uh, we're not interested in, the, uh, remarkably, uh, not surprisingly, but the, our real estate uh, portfolio has done pretty well. Uh, even even through this whole COVID thing because of its unique supply and demand dynamics. What we do to, to mitigate risk, Jay, is is look at the, the macro environment and, and Doug participates on that on a on a on a bi weekly basis when we do our calls to look at where there could be emergent weakness. And if necessary, we'll just start increasing cash positions. So you know for us March was not a bad period of time. We had Starting in September and with the uh, changes in the repo market, concerns you mentioned earlier, um, we take those to heart and started raising cash. So we were already at a 40% cash position mm. by the time we had the sell-off in March. And it, I just got to tell you, it's, it's nice not having to dig yourself out of a very deep hole. Yeah. You know, what money you lose in a, in a, in a, in a grand market sell-off, um, very easy to put back when, when it's a shallow, shallow correction. All things considered because of our cash positions. New accounts coming in, we were at an 80% cash position, so very cautious and able to put some of that money to work at much lower levels. So uh, we're hands-on folks, and you know nothing's delegated out. Um, we've got a great research team, a great, great trading team. And so to be able to put that together... Um, it's, I think it's compelling because it's not, you know, there's a lot of things we say no to. Um, you know, just because, frankly, I, it's not in our wheelhouse. Not that it's not a great and in, interesting idea. We'll miss out on opportunities like Netflix or opportunities like Tesla if you think that's an opportunity. Uh -huh. Um, we want real things. We want real things that pay us to wait. And if we can have real things that pay us to wait, we think in the fullness of time, we get paid handsomely, not only on the income side, but also on the cap gain side. That's actually where I think the precious metals mining shares factor in on the capital gain side. Uh, I think, you know, relative to bullion and relative to uh, the stock market in general, you're, you're looking at an area that's underappreciated, um, underowned, and I think has some very exciting uh, months, quarters, and years ahead. Mm -hmm. I uh, I think you're right about that, David. Well, I just I think that it's wealth uh, your wealth management team uh, and your philosophy in general. I think you have a great balance between uh, you know the extremes, a good balance. Uh, and certainly, I've known Doug Nolan for quite a few years when he was with David Tice years ago, and um, a really strong a really strong analyst and and very much aware of the credit aspects and the dangers in the markets. That uh, certainly was a a coup, I think, for you to bring him on. I, I think that's really great. Uh, anything else? Any words of encouragement you might be able to offer our listeners in in a time when you know a lot of people are down in the dumps? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's very easy to lose a a future focus and forget that whatever the crisis may be, whether it's uh, COVID or some some you know gathering crowds in the streets. Um, these things do pass. And so is there something that you can do in your life that keeps you both other-centered and future-focused? And that's where I would say, you know, devising a, a short list of, of goals and expectations. You know, I, I realize it's odd coming into the middle of the year to think about what you want to do as a New Year's resolution. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a lot of power internally, emotionally, and psychologically when you can say, I'm setting out to do X, Y, and Z. And then on a daily basis, be able to tick off and make some progress towards that. There's so many things in the context of COVID that you're not in control of. Do something simple that you are in control mm -hmm. of. It may be, you know, writing one page a day in a journal. It could be reading 25 pages a day, more than you ordinarily do. Just something, something that you say, this I've done, this I've accomplished. That's the box that I check for now. And I, I, th I think you're right. There's a lot of people under pressure and a lot of people experiencing near despair just because life is not normal. It's okay for life to not be normal. Remember that crisis always passes. And if you can keep your future focus and, and, and if you can create your own, I realize it's an arbitrary sense of accomplishment, but it is so healthy, so healthy for your brain chemistry. And uh, 
uh, I do that via uh, triathlon training, uh, as silly as that may seem, um, but it's a great outlet, and you can do that from reading to crossword puzzles to you name it. Oh, absolutely. Very good advice. A little less television and a little more reading or activity that you yourself are taking place of uh, in to, uh, uh, to have a sense of achievement. And, uh, and of course, I know that you're very big in terms of interpersonal relationships and forgiving and and uh, and seeking dialogue with people you might have differences with all a lot of that you talk about on your on your weekly shows as well so thanks so much uh, for being with us again david it's always refreshing to have you with us and uh, we'll look to do it again sometime i hope in the not too distant future jay thanks for the invite great to be back with you again 